Thank you. Um, PJ's right. I've known him for a very long time. Uh, in fact, I slipped in once in a while calling him Peter because he was Peter when I knew him. And I did have him in math. Uh, he was in my math class and I taught him how to add and multiply and I think I did okay. <laughs> I think you're doing well. I am delighted to be here. You're supposed to say that. Every time a speaker gets up, they talk about how pleased they are to be here. Um, but I, I, so I made a list of the reasons I'm glad to be here. Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be back in the United States again. I just finished an extensive tour up through Canada. Um, I love Canada. How many people in Canada? Oh, man. It's, every time I go up there, I learn as much as I teach. They're just doing some amazing things up there with kids. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing something right up there. They're, I don't believe that test scores is a no-all, end-all, but the reality is that their test scores are far better than ours are for our kids in our schools. And they say, and you know, we say, well, gee, there's so much diversity in the United States, and that's such a challenge. But there's just as much diversity in Canada. Uh, Toronto, I read a statistic, 75% of the people who live in Toronto aren't native uh, Canadians. They were born in another country. So I really do love going up there. They just really, you can't stereotype about a country, but it's just, they're nice. They're just so Canadian. I mean, you know, they, 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 they take really good care of each other. They have all these great programs. Um, another reason I went up there is they follow the American election very, very closely up there, and I thought that one of us should go up and apologize. Um, <laughs> it, uh, um, it, it's, uh, you know, it, at, the, at the reception last night, it, it, uh, there was all this, everybody talking about the election, and everybody's sort of going so nuts about it, and John Oliver put a great perspective on it the other night. It's so far away, it's so long away, and we're getting so concerned about it. He made the point that, see if you can follow this, there were babies that will be born on election day whose parents have not yet met each other. <laughs> that's how far, that's how long, I don't think about it, I don't know what that means in my home, but the, uh, um, <laughs> but I love going up to Canada, they, again, they take really good care of their folks, uh, they do a lot of really good really work going up there, you know, Maybe they can do that. They don't feel the need to go around the world blowing stuff up the way we always do. And uh, they're good, faithful allies. They kind of follow behind us and whisper into our ear. Are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure you want to get involved in that? When I'm up there, I say that you change their name to Canada. North America's designated driver. Um, but one of the reasons I love going up there is I can tell my favorite auditory discrimination story. Um, I tell the story. I think, in the Boston area, about 90% of the people get it, 95% get it in Detroit, Chicago, about 90% in New York. Tell it up in Canada, everybody gets it. Told it once in Biloxi, Mississippi, it was the longest five minutes of my life. It's a, it's a little bit regional. I know we got a national crowd here, but it's a little bit regional, but I think you'll get it. Um, it was told to me by a friend of mine named Margie Golick. Uh, those of you in special ed might, might know that name. She works at McGill University in, in uh, Montreal, and she's an extraordinary, extraordinary psychometrist. She tests kids all day long, six hours a day testing kids. And she's one of those old school, insightful psychometrists you'd love to have work with your kid. She's just amazing. And one of the things she does, I, I've watched her do it a dozen times, it's amazing. She'll bring a little boy in to her office for the standard three hour battery of testing. And at the end of the battery, she keeps in her middle draw a deck of playing cards. And she gives the cards to the kid and she says, teach me a card trick. Teach me a card trick. She believes that every little boy knows or at least thinks he knows a card trick. And she says that she often gets more insight about that kid and a better understanding about the way that kid views the world by watching him teach her a card trick for five minutes than three hours of uh, testing. She's one of those really insightful evaluators. And she was testing this eight-year-old boy from Montreal and she suspected he had an auditory discrimination problem. Now, if you don't know what that means, it's not that the kid is deaf or has a hearing loss. He just hears things a little bit differently than the way they're said. And of course, that can create great problems academically and socially. And she suspected he had one of those problems. She said, so Johnny, she said, I got a list of words here, and I'm going to read the word to you, and I want you to tell me what it means to use it in a sentence. You think you can do that? Well, six, seven, eight year old from Montreal says, sure, I can do that. She says, okay, John, the first word is poultry. Tell me what poultry means. The late year old from Montreal says poultry. Po oh, yeah, I know what poultry is. Poultry is if you get a rip in the couch, your mother has to send it out and have new poultry put on. <laughs> he said, oh boy, he's not hearing things the way they said. How about inspiration, John? Tell me what inspiration is. The late year old from Montreal says inspiration. Oh, yeah, I know what inspiration is. It's made out of fiberglass. The fiberglass it comes in big pink rolls, and your dad puts it in the attic between the floorboards, keeps the house nice and warm. He's a boy that hearing things the way they said. How about carousel, John? Tell me what carousel means. 
The lady girl from Montreal says carousel. Oh, you know what carousel is? I learned that in math lab. Those are two lines that run right next to each other. They never meet. They're called carousel lines. She says, well, you have the only things that are in the set up. Get a little more testing. She says, okay, John. So I'm going to tell you a story now, and I want you to listen very closely to this story because I'm going to ask you some questions about it later. But the story is not true. It's make believe. Do you know what make believe is? And he said, sure. It's a hockey team in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> the second reason I'm delighted to be here, and the primary reason I'm delighted to be here, is, as BJ said at the beginning, this is really coming home for us. We spent the first three years of our marriage here. We were married a month when we moved here. Took all of our belongings with us, everything we owned. And, you know, I know all I had was a Volkswagen, but luckily my brother had a Volkswagen too, so that did it. Um, and it was just, it was the whole, I mean, those, you folks, you can't believe what it was like. We had nothing. We used to get our paychecks on Wednesday. We supposed to get our paychecks on Wednesday. We get them on Friday with the notes that don't cash them until Monday. <laughs> there, there were no chairs. We used to we used to put them on, the, on our blackboard. The, the, after every class, the kids would have to carry chairs to the next class. And my lasting memory is seeing the kids walking through the snow with their book bags carrying chairs to the next class. We had nothing, but we loved it. We loved it, and it, it, it had such an impression, and we made lifelong friends here. Um, it was really, really a wonderful experience, um, and that's why I love coming back here. Um, but I make no bones about the fact that with all the changes that have been in this campus, the things that mean the most to me, and the things that are responsible for the success of this place is not the changes, but the things that remain the same. What makes this school special, it has a core. It has a core of values that were started in, in, in the 1970s, early 1970s. It's those belief systems of, about the way kids should be treated, the way we should handle each other, the way that a school should run, those things haven't changed. With all the huge changes going on, those things haven't changed. And that's what I want to talk about at the beginning of this, is the core values of this school that have not changed since the 1970s. And one of those is the secret weapon of this school. Every time I come to the school, I'm reminded of something that happened in Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower, as you remember, of course, was our president during the 1950s. And prior to that, he was general of the armies during World War II. But what a lot of people forget is in that intervening time between his time as a general and his time as our president, he served as the president of Columbia University. And the first time he met with the faculty and staff at Columbia, you could picture the scene, this huge auditorium with 1,500 faculty and staff to meet the university president for the first time. And Eisenhower got up to the podium and he said, aren't you lucky to be teaching at Columbia University? Aren't you blessed to be working at Columbia University? Aren't you fortunate to be teaching at Columbia University? And this elderly professor in the back of the room, who obviously had tenure, stood up and he said, with all due respect, General, we don't work at Columbia University. We don't teach at Columbia University. We are Columbia University. And that's the way it is in a school like this, the faculty and staff of the school. The faculty and staff, the folks who walk the halls, I mean, beautiful facilities, wonderful leadership team, terrific dedicated board, but it's the folks who walk the halls of the school that make it happen every day. That's the secret weapon of the faculty and staff of the school. And I was here was the same thing. People, again, we, there were no maintenance, and we used to do all the maintenance ourselves. And one of the things that I wanted to do this weekend, and it gives me great pleasure to do this, I hold four degrees in special education. But, and now, and the reason I do that, it all started here. Charles McDonald, um, PJ's father, took me to the office and he said, if you're gonna be in this field, you gotta keep learning. There's so much research in this field, you gotta keep learning. And so I did, and I devoted myself to be somewhat scholarly about this field. Even though I'm a practitioner and ran schools like this for 30 years, I've tried to keep a, a, a scholarly hat on, too. And I have collected now a 500-volume professional book, set of professional books. Um, I'm going into semi-retirement, and I'm gifting those books to uh, Eagle Hill School as for their professional library. <laughs> I say that because my only condition is, PJ, I would like is the books to display in the professional library for this to hang next to it. And what it says is, these volumes are gifted to Eagle Hill School in honor of the McDonald family, and recognition is devotion to the school that we love. With great respect and affection, Rick and Janet Malone. And I quote at the bottom, um, Father McDonald, we 
dug a hole for a building. It's so pleased to dig a hole to build a new building. There are only three or four buildings on the campus then. Building that's long to torn down. And Charles got up in front of the staff and he said, someday this school is going to get up and crawl. <laughs> 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 So let's talk about some of those core values, some of those things that, uh, that, that we believed in when we were here, um, and the school still believes in, some of those things that just do not change. The two most important words in a school like this, and nobody carries out better than, better than uh, uh, Eagle Hill, are support and challenge. That's what special ed is all about. The staff's job is to challenge the kid, keep that carrot at the end of the stick, give that kid goals to work toward to reach his potential, but to give him su the support he needs to meet those challenges. If you're just challenging the kid but not supporting him, that's not special ed. If you're su just supporting the kid but not challenging him, that's not special ed. It's that mix of support and challenge, and nobody does it better than they do here. Because one of the things we need to understand is adolescence, here's some bad news and good news for you. Adolescence is the worst time in the life for a kid who struggles with learning. It's the worst time in his life. The bad news is it's the worst time in his life. The good news is it's going to get better. It's going to get better, and I'll tell you why. It's a strike one, strike two, strike three for the adolescent with learning disabilities. Number one, strike one is, if you think about it, adolescence is the only period in your entire life where you're expected to do all things well. Math, science, history, social studies. Only during the four years of high school are you expected to be a generalist. The, you go to a high school, the valedictorian, the kid who leads everybody down the aisle at graduation, he's the kid that got all A's. Math, science, history, social studies. In our high schools, we celebrate the generalist. Then we turn them loose in the real world. In the real world, the real world couldn't care less about a generalist. There's no place in the world for a generalist. They're fun to watch on Jeopardy once in a while, but you, you notice they usually wear, wear pretty cheap suits. I mean, they're not making a lot of The reality is there is no place in the world for a generalist. The world wants a specialist. You're not going to ask your doctor any questions about the War of 1812 before she does surgery on you. You're not going to ask your attorney if you can solve an algebraic question before he, uh, before he does your books. The reality is, in the real world, we celebrate the generalist. Only in school do we celebrate the spec. Uh, only in school we celebrate the generalist in school and the specialist out there. So these are going to be the four toughest years for your kid because it's the only time when they're expected to do all things well. The way your kids are screwed together is they generally do one or two things exceedingly well. And once they get out in the real world, they can specialize in those things. Once they go off to college, they can specialize in that area. Only during adolescence you expect them to be a generalist. Your kids aren't generalists, they're specialists. It will get better. The second reason why adolescence is tough is adolescence, again, is the only time in your life where different is automatically bad. Little kids love, uh, uh, different is automatically bad. Little kids love things that are different. Adults love things that are different. You, got a, you take your five-year-old daughter to a, the mall and she sees somebody dressed like a clown. Oh, I want to go talk to him, Daddy. He's different. Little kids love things that are different. Adults love things that are different. You go to a cocktail party, you see somebody dressed in a dashiki or a turban, you say, let's go talk to that guy. He's got life experiences we don't have. He's different. That's interesting. But in adolescence, uh-uh-uh. Anything different is automatically suspect. If you're too tall or you're too short, or you're lousy at sports, or too good at sports, anytime you don't fit into that little box, you're automatically suspect, isolated, and rejected. And the reality is, our kids, because of the learning struggles, are different. And it's tough to be different when you're an adolescent. And the third thing that makes it difficult, or makes it a challenge, is something that's not studied, it should be studied far more, I think, in, um, in psychology. It's something that happens, allegedly, to all of us in adolescence. And it's called recognition of permanence. If it happened to you, it happened to me. Here's what it is. At some point in your life, around 16 or 17 years old, you're walking by a mirror, and you stop and you look in the mirror, and you say, that's it. That's me. I'm pretty much cooked now. I'm pretty much finished. What I am in that mirror today at 17 is what I'm basically what I'm going to be, a little smaller version of what I'm going to be for the rest of my life. Now, if when that moment of recognition of permanence comes, when you recognize that basically you're pretty much what you're going to be for the rest of your life, if you're going to a school that doesn't understand you, you're failing all your courses, 
<clears throat> cheerleaders make fun of you in the hallway, the football team bullies you, you don't have any friends, you look in the mirror and you say, this is it? I'm going to live with this guy for the next 60 years? This is what my life is going to be? But if, the day you look in the mirror, you're at a school that celebrates differences, you're at a school that takes care of you, you're with teachers who care about you. You're with other kids who care about you. You've got friends. You're on the soccer team. You're on, you, play, you have a role in the play. You're voted class officer. You look in the mirror that day and you say, I'm going to be okay. I can live with this guy. I can live with this guy for 60 years. And see, that's what, you, that's what this place does. And it does it better than anybody. It understands the nature of adolescence. I remember Jim Cavanaugh, who was the, the, uh, the, uh, former, one of the founders of the school, saying to us that kids should not celebrate their adolescence at the altar of their learning disability. They are ad they're not learning disabled adolescents, they're adolescents with learning disabilities. And they ought to, they ought to have uh, soccer teams, they ought to have plays, they ought to have art classes. They shouldn't give up their adolescence because they have a learning problem. And look what your guys do. Look, what, look at the opportunities your, your guys have in this very rarefied environment. When I was running a school very similar to this, a girl on our campus was elected vice president of the junior class. And she called her mother, the mother lived in Houston, the school was in Massachusetts, and she called her mother all excited, Ma, I was elected vice president of the junior class. And the mother was excited, but not quite as excited as the daughter thought she would be. And about five minutes of the call, she said, Ma, I gotta say, I thought you'd be crazy, I thought you'd be out of your mind about this. My colleague, my, my peers voted me vice president of the class, I thought you'd be so happy. And she said, I am happy, honey, I'm sorry, I am happy. But if you were in your local public school, we'd be able to take you out to dinner tonight. We'd have grandma and grandpa come over. We would have gone to the assembly to hear the announcement if you were not in your local public school. And she said, Ma, if I was in my local public school, I wouldn't be vice president of the junior class. <laughs> and that's the reality. That's what this school does. It takes kids out of the audience and puts them on the stage. It takes them off the bench and puts them on the playing field. It takes them out of the shadows and puts them in the light. That's what happens in a place like this. So when that moment of recognition of permanence hits your kid, and he looks in the mirror, he's going to say, I'm doing OK. I can live with this guy for the next 60 years. This is going to be all right. It's going to be OK. And nobody understands that better than this place does, because they do understand the, and, and by the way, the, look at the price that people pay if they don't have an adolescent. That's why it's so important to give your kid as normal an adolescence as possible. Because look at the price you pay if you don't. Look at all these young folks in Hollywood who are throwing their lives away. These 25-year-olds who were just, and athletes who were just abusing their lives and using drugs in their 20s. You want to know why? Because they never had an adolescence. During adolescence, they were training seven hours a day, or they were child stars, you know, recognized everywhere that they went. They were never allowed to have an adolescence. Now they're in their 20s, and they say, I want to have my adolescence now. I want to be footloose and fancy free now. And society says, no, you can't do it now. You're in your 20s. You go to jail for doing it now. We can let those things go when you're an adolescent. We understood when you're an adolescent, but you're not an adolescent anymore. So if you don't give a kid an adolescence, then you're going to really, really pay the price as years go on. And what this place understands is the nature of adolescence. How many of you are ra well, you're all raising adolescents. How many of you are raising more than one adolescent at a time? Yeah, you're the folks who are saying, we can stay till Wednesday, right? That's really no <laughs> Let me, let me give you the key to raising adolescents. You'll be much more effective raising your adolescent if and when you buy into this one simple concept. You'd be much more effective raising your adolescents once you buy into this one simple concept, and that is this. You cannot win. <laughs> once you realize you can't win, you stop all the power struggles. I'll tell you what I mean. You're a mom. You with your 14-year-old daughter. You're walking through the shopping mall with your 14-year-old daughter, and you run into a group of your daughter's friends. Okay? There are two mistakes you can make at the junction mall. Two mistakes you can make. One mistake is to ignore her friends. Do not talk to her friends, big mistake. The other mistake is to talk to her friends. <laughs> <laughs> and once you realize no matter what you do, you're wrong. Mother, you said hello, we don't say hello. I love to change school districts, you know. <laughs> and see, the reason for that is my all-time, I want my mentors, a genuine hero of mine, and every once in a while when you have a mentor, somebody you really feel strongly about, every once in a while they will say something or write something that is so profound, you just close the book and you say, my God, you've given me a gift. And my mentor gave me one of those gifts. 
About 25 years ago, I was reading something he read, he said in a book, and I, I closed the book and I thought, my God, you just give me a gift. I'm never going to forget what you just said. And what he did in one sentence is he totally described and analyzed the, the nature of adolescence. In one sentence, he described what adolescence is all about. And once you understand adolescence from this point of view, not only will you be more effective at raising your adolescent, but you'll also understand things you never understood before. Here's what he said. The nature of adolescence. Adolescence is a 24-hour day, seven day a week, 52 weeks a year, battle to not be embarrassed. That's it. The adolescent prayer is, dear God, don't let me be embarrassed today. And once you understand that that's the greatest fear of an adolescent to be embarrassed in front of his peers, so many of the things they do never make sense suddenly make sense. Every time I do a workshop on adolescents with parents, I say, give me, give me some words to describe adolescents. They say, adolescents are mean. Adolescents are mean. Well, they are mean. And you know what? So are you. There's not one of you, not one of you can't think of terrible things we did to other kids when we were growing up. Adolescents can be mean, but it's not because they're bad people. I'll tell you why. It's because of what I call the spotlight. The spotlight. Your first name, sir, please? Dean. Dean. Suppose there's five or six of us here. The folks in these, these two rows and me, suppose we're teenagers, we go to school every day, we live in the same town, we live in the same community, we're friends, we're buds, we take the school bus to school every day. But each of us gets in the bus with the same secret fear. Dear God, don't let it be me. Don't let the spotlight shine on me. Don't make me say something stupid or wore the wrong jeans. Please, God, don't let it be me today. Don't let the spotlight shine on me. And the bus is chugging along, and suddenly Dean says something stupid. And I say, great, here's my chance. Dean, I can't believe you said that. That is so stupid. Why would you say that? What a dumb thing to say. Basically, what I'm saying to him is, hey, Dean, I like you, I really do. But I'll throw you under this bus in a minute. <laughs> if it keeps the spotlight off of me. And what kids soon realize is if the spotlight's not, if the spotlight's on Dean, it can't be on me. So I put the spotlight in him, so he jumps on Dean, and she jumps on, and she jumps on Dean, and we ride Dean like a horse all the way to school. He gets off the bus. What the devil was that all about? Just your turn, pal. Just your turn, not the person. <laughs> and one of the magic things that happens here is because all of your kids have been at the bottom of a totem pole someplace, because all of your kids have had trouble with other kids, they are extraordinarily kind to each other. Because they've all been here. They've all been there and they know what it's like and they know what hurts. And they take extraordinary care of each other. But part of the nature of adolescence is understanding that, that the number one fear of the adolescent. And now for you new parents, you've got a whole bunch of new friends that you can embarrass your kids in front of. You know, the whole group of kids that uh, you can be an embarrassment to. So welcome to Parent Weekend. Um, <laughs> Another thing that undergirds the, this entire uh, history of the school is positive versus negative feedback. I go to so many schools and they've got all these demerit programs and these punishment programs. And from the very, from the first day I came on this campus in 1972, we were taught this. And it still is the core value of the school. There are two ways you can deal with a kid's behavior. Positive feedback and negative feedback. We all know that. Positive feedback is praise, reinforcement, encouragement. Negative feedback is punishment, taking something away. We all know that. What we forget many times is the kid's response to positive and negative feedback. And that is this. Positive feedback changes behavior. Negative feedback only stops behavior. You will not change a kid's behavior by punishing. You can punish a kid till the cows come home. You are not going to change that behavior. The only way to change the behavior is through positive feedback. And I'll tell you what I mean. I'm sitting in my office. I look all over the playground and see Tom picking on Jim. Tom always picks on Jim. So I bring Tom in the office. I say, I'm tired of seeing you bully Jim. I want you to write 500,000 times I will not pick on Jim. Great thing we do in schools, right? Half the staff are they get to get you enjoy writing, the other half is in writing. It's a punishment. That doesn't, that doesn't change. Now I got a kid, teacher bring a kid in my office one day by this rough neck. Rick, I've kept Billy in for recess 15 days in a row, and he still isn't doing his math homework. Well, that circle is a little learner in this picture, all right? It's not working. Then my boy try something else. So I bring Tom into the office, I tell him he can't, I, I say, I'm tired of seeing you pick on Jim, uh, you, you've got to write 500 times I will not pick on Jim, you can't go to recess again until you're voting age, I'm going to uh, call your parents, tell them we're an awful kid you are, and I'm going to bring on the principal, he's going to yell at you for a while. All negative feedback. Folks, I guarantee you, we guarantee you, as a result of that negative feedback, Tom will never, ever, ever pick on Jim again, outside my office. <laughs> 
God saved him. Anywhere else on campus or before school or after school or a day that I'm not there. Because the only thing negative feedback does is stops behavior. It does nothing to change the behavior. Conversely, I'm sitting in my office one day. I see Jim carrying the bases for the baseball coach, and he drops one. And he's bending over trying to pick it up without dropping the others. And I see Tom, the bully, come over his way. And I think, great, Tom's going to kick the base out of his reach, make his life miserable. But instead, of, I'm delighted to see Tom bend over, pick up the base, and hand it very nicely back to Jim. I stick my hand and say, hey, Tom, come here for a second. I just saw what you did. Really nice thing you just did. You know, I called your mom last week when you were bullying kids. I think I'll give her a call today and tell her what I just saw. And I go walking down the hall with my arm around her shoulder and I bump into the principal. I say, hey, Jim, let me tell you what I just saw Tom do. In fact, I could use some big, uh, big guys like Tom to come over to the uh, library help me move some books. Come on, we'll talk about the ball game last night. All positive feedback. I will equally assure you that Tom has more likely to be nice to Jim the next time he sees him, whether or not I'm around. Because positive feedback changes behavior. Negative feedback only stops it. I don't want anybody saying, you know, Eagle Hill had some guy speaking, he said we should never punish kids. I mean, come on, we raised three kids, I ran residential schools for 150 kids a year for 30 years. Of course, there's times kids need to be punished, but we need to do it with the understanding that you're not changing anything. The only way to change behavior is to catch it being good and reinforce it. That's why you don't hear a lot about punishment around here. Of course, there are sometimes kids need to be repr reprimanded and punished, but it's not the core value in this place. It is in so many schools. Dr. Phil, I don't understand a damn word that man says. And I'll tell you the thing that confuses me about Dr. Phil is his audience seems to understand it. And he says all these non secretaries, the audience, hey, Dr. Phil. One of his things, his latest thing is, no matter how flat you make a pancake, it's got two sides. And, you know, what do I do with that gem of information? <laughs> He had a married couple up on stage one time, they were, having, they were having marital problems. He said, you know, you folks remind me of a pair of shoes, but you don't have any shoelaces. And the audience goes, hey, what does that mean? You <laughs> didn't hear anything? And they had a woman up on stage one time, her, uh, her, her whole complaint was her family takes it for granted, they don't appreciate it. And he said, well, darling, we've got to go to commercial, but I'll tell you one thing. They can kill you, but they can't eat you. <laughs> I never know what he's talking about. But there's one thing Dr. Phil says I understand exactly what he's talking about, and I could not disagree more. His book, God Bless Him, Family First, number one selling book ever written about raising children. Just passed out the Dr. Spock book that raised most of us. It's been in the market for 50 years. Number one book ever written about raising children. The entire premise of that book is simply this. When the kid does something that displeases you, find the thing he most wants, needs, and likes, and take it away from him. That's a solution to every problem. Your daughter not behaving herself, uh, uh, staying out too late, what's her favorite thing? Cell phone, take it away. Your son not reaching his potential in school, what's his favorite thing? Skateboard, take it away from him. I actually heard him say one time, take the kid out in the driveway and make him watch when you drive over with the skateboard in your car. <laughs> Find the one thing the kid most wants, needs, and likes, and take it away from him when he's bad. Folks, that's just loud to human relation. Doesn't work with adults, why would it work with kids? I'll tell you what I mean. 50% of American marriages now end in divorce. Sad statistic, 50%. That number's going down, by the way. But it's only because people don't get married anymore, so they don't show up in the statistics. <laughs> but 50% of American marriages end in divorce. 80% of that 50% end in divorce over what two issues? What two issues break up most marriages? Uh, no, children are third. Money and sex. Money and sex. And here's what happens. The spouse who controls the money or the sex the spouse is in control of the distribution of that commodity. Dangles it overhead of the other one. And said, I control whether or not you get any of this. I control whether or not we have sex or whether or not you get the money. I'm in control of that. And when you please me, I'm going to give you something. And I'm not happy with you. You ain't getting any. No, no, you're not being good. No, 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 you're not being good. And takes the thing the other spouse wants, needs, and loves, and uses it to punish, reward, and manipulate. And after a while, what does the other spouse say? Forget about it. You know what's something I want, you know what's something I need, you know what's something I love. And you're using it to punish me, reward me, and manipulate me. That's no way to treat somebody you care about. It's over. Why would it work with kids? Find the one thing the kid most wants, needs, and likes, and take it over, take it away when, when he's bad. That Kate plus eight, the lady with all the kids, but one of the reality shows, 
She said in the show, the reason I give my kids cell phones is so I can take them away from them, take them away when they're bad. Whoa, mother of the year, let's go. Um, I mean, really, is that any way? Is that any way to treat somebody? You, you know, you're going to go to speakers about your kids for the rest of your life, and every speaker says the same thing, and I'm going to say it. And the reason we all say it is it's true. What your kids need more than anything else is unconditional love. Unconditional love. Is there anything more conditional than that? I know you like this, and I'm only going to give it to you when you make me happy. Is there anything more conditional than that? You know, I was speaking in Kansas City a number of months ago now, the woman who picked me up at the airport to take me to the venue, the woman from the association, um, as we got in the car, she said, I'm sorry, I've got some phone calls I've got to take, there's something going on with my kid. I said, not a problem. Without, within five minutes, the phone rang. Hello? Hi, honey. Oh, no, 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 I don't like that at all. No, I don't want to do that. No, I know the principal thinks it's a good idea. He can call me if he wants, but I don't like that idea at all. No, okay, all right. Okay, have a good have a good day, honey. I'll see you at dinner. Bye bye. Hangs up. Says my husband. Five minutes later. Oh, hi, Dr. Smith. Yeah, I just spoke to my husband. I, I know that he's on board with this, and you think it's a good idea, but I, I don't want to do it that way. I, I just I know the teacher think the teacher can call me if she wants, but I think I'm going to dig my heels into this. I really don't think it's a good idea. Okay. All right. Thank you for calling, sir. Bye bye. Hangs up. Principal. Then hi, hi, Miss Smith. The teacher called the social worker. She got five phone calls in a period of a half hour. Finally, she's driving on the road. She turns to me. These tears running down her cheeks. She said, help me with this, will you? Help me with this. Am I going crazy or what? She said, my son is 12 years old. His life is a mess. She said, I don't know how he gets out of bed in the morning. I don't know how he puts his feet in the floor. He's got tremendous learning and language problems. He's doing very poorly in school. Every kid in the community has labeled him as a loser. The phone never rings. He never gets invited anywhere. He doesn't even get along with, didn't even get along with his own brothers and sisters. There's only one thing in this life, kid's life that's going well, and that is tennis. He plays tennis every Wednesday night, and he's really, really good at it. And the coach loves him, because the kid's got ADD, so after practice, he runs around, picks up all the tennis balls, you know, the coach loves him. The other kids, the other 12 year olds love playing with him, because he's a really good tennis player. The younger kids look up to him like he's a hero, because he's so good. Wednesday night's the only night in this kid's life that goes well. She said, you know, some, most kids live from Saturday to Saturday. My kid lives from Wednesday to Wednesday. And tonight's Wednesday. And he didn't do his math homework last night. And I've got his dad and the principal and the teacher and the social worker saying, don't let him go to tennis. Keep him home from tennis. That'll teach him. And she looked at me with tears running down her cheeks and she said, isn't he entitled to one night a week? Can he have one night a week that nobody can mess with? One night a week that, that can to sustain him till the following Wednesday? Isn't he entitled to one night a week? You bet he is. She should have a national television show. That's wisdom. Find the one thing the kid most wants, needs, and likes, and take it away from him when he's bad. What a lousy way to treat somebody you care about. And there's not a lot of that goes on, that goes on, on around here. But the real, one of the real secrets of success of this school is you folks. These buildings, this beautiful property would not have happened without the dedicated work and incredible generosity, generosity of Eagle Hill parents over the years. And the reason that you find yourself having a good relationship with the school where you maybe you never did before is that you kind of have an unspoken rule between Eagle Hill and you. And the rule goes like this. If you promise to believe only half of what the kids tell you happens at school, we promise to believe only half of what they tell us happens. <laughs> And once you subscribe to that theory, you're, you're, you're pretty much there. But it really is important. It's important to understand. I ran a school in Cape Cod for 15 years, and the school beautifully decorated. Cape Cod antiques, every place, absolutely gorgeous school. Parents Association raised all this money. Beautifully decorated school, except for one room, the room I decorated. It was the conference room where we met to talk about kids. It was the uh, a conference room where we met as a staff to discuss children. It was a room where we met with parents to talk about their kids. It's a room where we met with outside consultants to talk about that ch their, uh, talk about children. And this room was totally barren. No, no uh, wall hangings, no beautiful window treatments, no plants in the corner. Totally barren. Table and 12 chairs. That's it. There was only one thing that hung on the wall. And the reason it was the only thing that hung on the wall is when people walked into that room, I wanted them to realize those were the rules once you walk in this room. And all that was on the wall was a sign. It was an old African proverb. I don't know about you. We get so tired about hearing about new wisdom. There's no new wisdom. 
All the wise stuff has been said. It's in the Bible. It's in Dickens. It's in Shakespeare. All the wise stuff has been said. And I love ancient Proverbs because there's so much wisdom there. And I found this centuries-old African proverb that was so perfect. I had a sign made of it and I hung that office in that conference room for 12 years. And here's what it said. When elephants fight, it's the grass that gets trampled. Two, three times a rogue elephants meet in the jungle. They're banging heads and banging heads but for hours, but they're so strong and powerful and well protected with that bony structure in the front of that skull. After banging heads for three hours, they walk away unscathed, unhurt, ready to fight another day. But in the meantime, they've leveled every shrub, every blade of grass, every piece of vegetation in the area is trampled and gone forever, and that's the way it is in the lives of kids. If the adults in a kid's life are fighting, it's a kid who gets hurt. You got an ego thing going with a teacher. You're the parent. Every time you go to a meeting, boom, boom, back. Fine. You're big and strong. She's big and strong. You'll come back to fight another day. But in the meantime, a kid's gotten hurt. And that sign was a reminder. Once you walk in that room, you check your ego at the door. You are there to deal with the kid's needs. Because when elephants fight, it's the grass that gets trampled. And I think the school personifies that. It does require a very special kind of parenting. To parent a child who struggles in school. Um, I was interviewed on National Public Radio a couple of weeks ago. It's really nerve-wracking being an interview on NPR uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, the guy, you know that the guy who's interview, interviewing you is smarter than you. I mean, that's a gift. It's a gift, right? And the other thing on NPR interviews is they're 17 minutes long with no break. I do a lot of radio work. They did a radio interview the other day. But there were always breaks, commercials, where you can say to the interviewer, well, look, ask me about this. Or you can kind of maneuver the interview. The NPR, no, 17 minutes live. And I mean, people listen to NPR. You know, you screw up on NPR, you're going to find real work. You know, it's, a, and it, it's, it's kind of nerve wracking. And the interview went swimmingly, went really, really well. And the interview's got about, got about a minute left. And the interviewer said, Well, Mr. LeBoy, if you could tell the American people one thing about children, what would that be? <laughs> kind of a tough question with no preparation. But what I used was something from one of my books, and I think it was timely. I said, We need to come to the profound understanding that kids go to school for a living. It's their job. They do it six hours a day. Not only is it their job, in our culture, it's their entire identity. Think about it. You're walking through your neighborhood, you're bumping into an 11-year-old kid you haven't seen for a while. What's the first thing you say to him? Hi, Billy. What? How's it going? Now, you might be with his dad for two hours before you think to ask his dad how things are at work. In our culture, we don't identify adults with what they do for a living, but we very clearly identify kids with what they do for a living. So when a kid is failing and struggling in school, it attacks his entire identity. I believe how school. So when a kid is struggling in school, it has an impact on everything the kid does, on the way he views himself, on the way he views you, on the way he views the world. It attacks his entire identity. That's why sometimes you need to call off the calendar and have a child go to a place like this. It gets that because it does. In a very, very, very different kind of parenting. And the most the primary thing, the most important thing to parent a special needs child is something that's been kind of the hallmark of my career my entire life, which is the concept of fairness. What does it mean to be fair? What does it mean to be fair? When you get out of here, go up to the first eight, nine, or ten year old kid and say to him, kid, Use his name if you know his name. It's more personal. <laughs> Say, kid, what does it mean to be fair? What does it mean to be fair? If he's an only developing eight, nine, to ten year old kid, he will tell you this: that fairness means that everyone gets the same. Kids in their low level of moral development believe the only way to be fair as a parent or teacher is to treat everyone exactly the same. And a generation of kids have taught us, a generation of parents and teachers, that that's what fairness means. You don't believe me? Look at the way we act. You're on a business trip. You're in Detroit. You're in the bookstore in Detroit. You've got three kids at home, 8, 10, and 12. You see a book on dinosaurs a 10-year-old would love. But you can't find a book for the 8-year-old and the 12-year-old, so you don't buy it because you never bring a book home to one and not the others, right? The holidays, Christmas time, this goes nuts. Christmas Eve, you look under the tree. Johnny's got nine gifts. Sally's got nine gifts. Joey's only got eight gifts. You jump in the car, you drive to Walmart, you buy a can of spray deodorant or a pineapple or something, you wrap it up the Christmas paper and put it under the tree because it all needs to be the same. Because the kids have convinced us that the only way to be fair as a parent or a teacher is to treat everyone the same. Well, you're going to have a long weekend this weekend, but I'm going to give you, to give you some homework. When you get home, go down into your basement, go up into your attic, go into your garage, 
find your old uh, uh, college textbooks and find your old philosophy book. Look up the definition of fairness. Fairness doesn't mean that everyone gets the same. Fairness has never meant that everyone gets the same. Fairness actually means that everyone gets what he or she needs. Fairness is based on need. Fairness and equality are antonyms. They're listed in, in, uh, in the New American Arabs Dictionary as antonyms. They mean the opposite. Equality means everyone gets the same. Fairness means everyone gets what he or she needs. And I'll tell you what I mean. We got about 250 people in this room right now. Suppose some philanthropists were to come in and give me $250,000 in cash and say, Rick, here's $250,000 in cash, 250 people. Divide that money equally amongst the people in the room. Divide it equally. How much would everybody get? That's easy, $1,000. Well, 250 people, 250 grand, everybody gets 1000 But what if we said, please take this money, Rick, and divide it fairly amongst the people in this room? How much would everyone get then? I don't know, but I guarantee it wouldn't be an equal distribution of those funds. Maybe there's somebody in this room with a chronically ill child at home, and $9,000 would allow that kid to have surgery or therapy he couldn't otherwise have. Well, fairness, we did take that need to be taken care of first. Yeah, but what if there's somebody in this room who lost their house to a fire last month? If they don't come up with $11,000 by the end of next month, they're not going to have a place to live. Well, fairness, we did take that need to be taken care of first. What if we ran our lives according to the fairness doctrine? What if we ran our lives according to fairness, the, what kids believe fairness is? I'm sorry, your first name, sir? Bruce. Bruce. And suppose in the middle of my lecture, God forbid, in the middle of my lecture, Bruce clutches his chest, falls to the ground, and rolls here at my feet. I look down at him, he's turning blue, God forbid, cardiac arrest. My mother's Irish, if you say God forbid, it can't happen. So, do it all right. So Bruce is like, he's having a heart attack. I'm trading CPR, I know what to do. How ludicrous, how moronic, how unethical, how absolutely strange would it be for me to say, gee, Bruce, you are hurting for certain. You really do need CPR. And I know what to do, but heck, Bruce, we have 250 people here today. I have a good time to give CPR to everybody. It wouldn't be fair to just give it to you. So I'm going to take you and drive you over here behind the podium, and as soon as I get done well, speaking, I'll give you CPR. But gee, Bruce, it wouldn't be fair to give it to you. Ludicrous. He needs it the rest of your time. The only, you have a child in your family with special needs through no fault or choice of your own. In order to be fair, you've got to treat him differently. This kid is going to take more time, more energy, and more resources from the other, than the other kids would. Is that equal? No. Is it fair? Yes. yes. Your job is to meet their needs. Get over the guilt trip of, I don't treat all my kids the same. Because if you treat them all the same, you're not a very good parent, frankly. The reality is our job is to meet kids' needs because their needs are different. What they get is going to be different. And what parents always say to me, the name of this workshop is On the Waterbed, the special needs child at home and in the family. And the reason I call it On the Waterbed is because of an analogy that I draw. Whenever I work with a family of five, including my own, I try to keep this analogy in mind. A family of five is like five people lying side by side on a waterbed. Whenever one person moves, everyone feels a ripple. And that's the way it is in a family. You don't have a special needs child, you've got a special needs family. And it impacts on everything. I'm writing a book on this. I've got a chapter on aunts and uncles. I've got a chapter on grandparents. I've got a chapter on siblings. It impacts everybody. And one of the, one of the questions I always get from parents is, how do I make it up to the other siblings? We had to sell the summer place in order to send the kid to a special school. How do I make that up to the siblings? You don't. And the more you try to make it up, the more you try to balance the scales, the more that waterbed gets rocking and rolling. As long as you can look in the eyes of the sibling and say, honey, if it was you, I'd be doing the same thing. Believe me. Okay, we have to you know, tighten the belt a little bit to send him to school. I have to, I have, to have him help with his homework at night. He's you know, going to therapy appointments and all that kind of thing all the time. I know, I know that those are sacrifices from all of us. But honey, if it was you, I'd be doing the same thing. Aren't you fortunate it's not you? But that doesn't in any way diminish my responsibility to you, brother. This concept that I've been talking about for a long time actually has its roots, deep roots in American history. Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers, woke one time, there is nothing so unequal as the equal treatment of unequals. There is nothing so unequal as the equal treatment of unequals. The reality is, your child, this child, the child here at the school is going to take more time, more energy, and more resources from you than the other kids. Is that equal? No. Is it fair? Yes. Yes. So the first thing you need to understand is that. The second thing in the crux of the conversation, I want to talk about the journey that you're on. A journey that 
You might not even know your own. And candidly, and again, one of the special things about this place is this place understands your journey because so many people don't. My goal now in the twilight of my career is to teach my colleagues about the journey that special needs families are on. That's all I'll speak about. I got called to, will you do a thing on motivation? No, I'm not only going to talk about families. And in the last, the last couple of years of my career, I'm trying to teach my brothers and sisters in education because they just don't get it. And I've been doing this kind of work for 40 years, and you think you've heard everything. Nothing can shock you. Well, I was in St. Louis in September. Young mom came up to me, seven-year-old boy with Tourette's syndrome. Now that's a journey. That family's got a very long and difficult journey ahead of it. And she told me this story. Listen to this. The kid had been in first grade for five days. It was the Friday at the end of his first week in school. And her phone rang at home. Mother answered the phone. Hello, Mrs. Jones. This is Mrs. Smith. I'm your son's first grade teacher, and we need to talk. And the mom said, well, thank you for calling. What can I do for you? And the teacher said, well, we had a speaker come through this summer who told us that whenever you call a parent on the phone, you should always begin the conversation by saying something kind and positive about the child. But frankly, I can't think of a single kind of positive thing to say. You know what the mother said? Call me back when you can. And I know. <laughs> oh, that moment is not going to say the right thing. But can you imagine beginning a conversation that way? Can you imagine calling another member of the human race and saying, I spent 25 hours with your child and I can't think of a single kind thing to say? You've got most phone calls. You've dealt with those folks. It's a small percentage of teachers. It's a small percentage, but even one is too many. And what I'm trying to do is educate people, my colleagues, to the journey that you folks are on. And it's a journey, frankly, that no one asks for. Very candidly, there's never been in the history of mankind a pregnant woman who got on her knees and said, Dear God, please give me a special needs kid. Give me one of those. Give me a kid who gets those funny stomach aches around the 5th of August every year because he knows he's got to get back in that roller coaster again. God, give me a kid from whom the worst part of his day is recess and the lunch and the school bus ride, the best part of the day for other kids. Give me one of those. You're in a journey that no one asks for. And we're supposed to be guides on that journey. And we just don't get it as a view. We just don't get it. I don't know why I can to change that. But let's talk about the journey that you've been on. Somebody did what's called the computer apex search or something like that, where they take all the research done on one topic and throw it into a computer. And the research spits out five or six things that all of the research agrees on. Like they take all the research on where should a city build an airport, they throw it in to a computer and it spits out, well, there are 35 studies that have been done, and these are four or five things that all the studies seem to agree with. Someone did that with all the research that's been done on you folks, parents with kids with special needs. And this is, what the, this is what one of the findings was. When I read this, it knocked me on my tail. I couldn't believe it. Here's what it said. The parental reaction of the diagnosis of learning disability is more severe and more profound than the diagnosis of any other type of exceptionality. Parents respond strongly, more strongly than the diagnosis of learning disabilities. And by the way, I'm going to use the broadest definition of learning disabilities there is. And I do need to talk about that for a second. I do use the term learning disability. When I talk to kids, I use the word different. When I'm talking to adults, I use the word disabilities, and I'll tell you why. I think, Paul, first of all, if you can't deal with language, in 2015 in the United States of America, you've got a disability. Our culture demands you know how to deal with language. Secondly, I think, frankly, having worked residential schools with these kids for my entire adult life, putting them to bed at night, getting them up, getting them up in the morning, I think calling it a difference minimizes their struggle. It's more than a difference. It impacts on every moment of the day. There's all kinds of research that indicate that even impacts on when we're asleep. This is a neuro neurologically based problem for most of these kids. It's more than a difference. And thirdly, thirdly, I know it's, I mean, again, I use difference when I talk to kids. Thirdly, I'm somebody who spends a lot of my time testifying before legislators trying to get more money for our kids. We're not getting the money we need when we call it a disability. We start calling it a difference and it's just going to go away. So I do use the term, I do use that term, and when I'm using it for this presentation, I'm using the broadest definition, all of those kids with what I call the mixed blessing. The mixed blessing, the hidden handicap. The kids who have the mixed blessing of looking like everybody else, but viewing the world very differently. If I had one wish for all of our kids, 
It would be that our kids with learning problems had a little star-shaped mole on the side of their head. So anytime an adult looked at them, they'd say, okay, this guy looks like everybody else, but he's not hearing me the way everybody else is. He's not listening the way everybody else is. He's not getting it the way everybody else is. I mean, you walk this campus, you've got an embarrassingly handsome group of kids here. You make beautiful children, you really do. Congratulations. And it's so difficult for coaches and, and, and regular age teachers and folks who pass through your life to look at this handsome, handsome kid and realize, yes, he's a beautiful kid and he's well put together thanks to you, but the reality is he's got a tremendous language uh, and learning problem. And so I'm going to use the term learning disabilities, but parents respond more strongly to the diagnosis of learning disability than any other exception out. More than Down syndrome, more than cleft palate, more than uh, congenital uh, birth defects, congenital facial deformities. Now, I don't, I don't want to get too ethereal about this, but if I were to die and go to heaven, and God were to say, Rick, you're going to come back, you come back to earth, you can either come back to the person with severe Down syndrome or a person with a learning disability, I think I'd know what I think, wouldn't you? Yeah. And yet the response, the forever response of the diagnosis of learning disabilities is more severe and more profound than the diagnosis of any other type of exceptionality. Why? Why? Forever, yeah. Anybody? Excuse me. Ten months more from the time. I'm sorry? Can I wait a month more from the time? Do you know what to do with a certain Okay, there's a bit all these are good answers, not the one I'm looking for. Yes. Bingo, you got it, you got it. The word is onset. When you have a child with Down syndrome, when do you find out about it? The baby comes down the birth canal and the doctor looks and says, we need to talk, we need to talk. And you leave the hospital knowing you've got a lifetime of sacrifice and special ed. It's not that way for kids with learning disabilities. The preschool development of most LD kids is largely uneventful. It's not until you get the diagnosis that you look back and say, gee, he did walk a little bit slower than the others, talk a little bit slower than the others. The reality is, you think you've got an otherwise typical kid in your hand, and in third grade, you get a phone call or referring a kid for special ed. It's a whole different response that you have because it comes like a thief in the night. You didn't see it coming. You didn't see it coming. So you respond totally, in a totally different way than the, uh, uh, than the parent of a, of a different kind of, of exceptionality. Now there are two, I love working with parents of special needs kids, but there are two things that have always puzzled me about you guys. One is what I call the difference in professional perception. That is the number of times in my career that I've disagreed very strongly with one of my colleagues about the same set of parents over time. The school I ran in Connecticut was a, a, a school where public schools would send their kids to us. If the public school had, there was a kid who was too complex to deal with, they would send it to us. And so many times after the kid had been with us for six months, the, uh, uh, the administrator from the public school would come to see how he's doing, and they'd say, how's Johnny doing? He said, he's doing fine. And they'd look around and say, but aren't the parents obnoxious? <laughs> I'd say, no, they're, they're all good. I never, well, I'll tell you what I mean. When I was down in Greenwich, um, I ran the, uh, the, basically the public high school, uh, the private independent high school, secondary school for kids with, spe with special needs in town. One of my best friends was a guy named Tony Minotti. Tony ran the public high school for special needs kids in town. Now you'd think that we would be at each other and at odds, but we weren't. We were great friends, went to graduate school together, our wives knew each other, we hung out together, and we really, really agreed on almost everything professionally. And I remember one day Tony called me and he said, Rick, we just had the parents from hell in here. I mean, we talk about you, you talk about us, right? I mean, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> he just had the parents from hell in here. He said, set of parents and moved here from the Midwest. He said, I'll tell you, they were tough. They got a special needs kid. They came to look at what we got at the public high school. They were awful. They were, they were obnoxious. They were rude. They made my secretary cry. They were supposed to stay for an hour. They had an hour to and stay for four hours. We told them they couldn't talk to anybody in school because of confidentiality. They'd go right up to kids, you know, what do you think about special ed in the school? They were obnoxious, and they hated our program at the high school. So I gave them your business card. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. He said, next time they're in town, they're going to come and see you. About six months later, I got a phone call. Oh, Mr. Lavoie, the, the Smiths, we live in, oh my God, it's a parent from hell. <laughs> okay, give my secretary the day off. Give my, give my crucifix to work. They're ready to fight off these evil boots. They come in here, wonderful. Oh, Mr. Lavoie, you've heard such, well, I love when elephants fight, but a gene that that's so, we got to work together. And I'm thinking, whoa, what is this? 
How come six months ago they were so difficult with Tony and with me they were great? What's that all about? Then I figured, well, it's because I'm better at healing than parents and Tony is. <laughs> but then it happened a couple times the other, the other way around. I used to be the president of the Connecticut Association for Children with Learning Disabilities. And we used to, on Saturdays, have what we called Saturday drop-in hours. And a group of us professionals would be in the office, and parents would just drop by on Saturday morning without an appointment uh, on their errands and drop in and ask for some advice on their kids. And I called Tony one time and said, Tony, get ready. Woo, there's a set of parents coming down your way. They're moving into Greenwich, and they came to the drop-in hours. They had two questions. Where's Greenwich High School, and who's the best lawyer in town? They're all ready to sue you. They haven't met you yet. They're all ready to sue you. Get ready. It's going to be rough. So Tony calls me a few months later. We're talking about something. He said, oh, by the way, remember those parents you warned me about? I said, yeah. He said, they were just in. They were great. The IEP is all signed. Uh, uh, mom wants to volunteer in the school. The, mother, the, the father wants to um, the teach Indian law to the kids. He said, what are you, losing your touch there, pal? And I said, what is this all about? How can two professionals disagree so strongly about the same set of parents over time. But the second and most important thing is what I call the inability to achieve consensus. The number of times in my career that I've sat across from a married, intact couple, a couple who agree on everything. They like the same wine, they like the same music, they like the same restaurants, they agree politically, they can pick out furniture together, they agree on everything except their special needs kid. And as soon as his name comes on the agenda, the swords come out as World War III. And I used to think, how can parents who agree on so much in their life disagree so strongly about the most important thing in their life? To the point that sometimes you'd sit down with them and you'd swear they're talking about two different kids. The mom and the dad view the kids so differently, you swear they're talking about two different kids. And I never understood that until I ran into the work of Eleanor Westhead. Eleanor Westhead is uh, no longer with us. She passed away several years ago. University of Virginia psychologist, and I've done a lot of work on the theory since then. I think it's more than a theory. I think it's solid, cold fact. She's come up with a theory, or a practice, or an understanding of the way, of the, the journey that parents go through when you get the diagnosis. Let me, tell you, let me tell you what it looks like. This is the model. The important thing to understand, that only the words written in uppercase are, are predictable. They, they usually begin with denial, then you bounce around in these emotions and hopefully come out in acceptance. Only denial, only denial is, uh, and acceptance are, are uh, anywhere near predictable. One might, mom might go from denial for months, flight for a week, fear for a year, isolation for a day, angry for a month and out of acceptance. Another might, mom might go from denial for a year, guilt for three days, bargaining for a month, angry for a week, isolation, back to blame and out of acceptance. There is no predictor factor in terms of the order you go through the stages, the number of stages you go through, or what stages you skip. And when I get through with this, some of you are going to be thinking about looking in your kitchen window because this is what you've been going through. So let's take, a look. let's take a look at the model. Generally, the first response when you get the diagnosis of learning disabilities is denial. I've had the unpleasant duty countless times in my life of saying, I've tested your child and um, he has a severe learning disability. And invariably, the first response is denial. Oh no, that can't be true. Oh no, that can wait till next year. Denial is the number one defense mechanism we use to protect ourselves. But that's how we protect ourselves from pain. When you heard about the death of Princess Di, the assassination of President Kennedy, if you remember that, the World Trade Center, what's the first thing you said? Oh no, that can't be true. Somebody came into your office and said, two planes have hit the World Trade Center and one of the buildings fall. The first thing you said is, oh no, that can't be true. Basically what you're saying is, what you're telling me is so big that you're not wrap my mind around it, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna deny it. Because as long as I deny it, I don't have to deal with it. If, God forbid, you got a phone call tonight that something happened terrible with someone in your life, the first thing you would say is, oh no, that can't be true. Basically, what you're saying is, I can't deal with what you're telling me, so I'm going to deny it until I'm equipped to deal with it. Now, denial can become pathological. In the summertime, we live in the back, we live in the, uh, uh, in Hyannis Port, Cape Cod. There's an 85-year-old gentleman who lives there. He gets up every morning. Raises his American flag, raises his prisoner W, a POW, prisoner of war, a missing in action flag, and goes into his house and begins his day, which is he writes emails to the president and every single member of Congress every day asking them to reopen the search for the missing in action in Vietnam. His beloved only son disappeared in the jungles of Vietnam in 1972, and this gentleman, who's a brilliant, brilliant former bank president, is convinced that his son is alive and trying to get out of the jungle. 
and he would probably go to his grave, go to his grave believing his son is still alive. Psychologically, what's happening there is he psychologically knows he can't deal with the death of his son. So as long as he denies it, he doesn't have to deal with it. And the first response many times from parents is deny. Then you begin jumping, and of course many times those professionals we say, oh, she doesn't care about it. She, but we said she's be tested. Mother said, no, she doesn't care. No, it's just you've just gotten some bad news, and you're going to deny it for a while. Then you start bouncing around through the stages. Bargain. We'll move. We'll change schools. I'll stop smoking. I'll give more money to the church. I'll give more money to the synagogue. Trying to, like, I'll take what's beyond door number three. You know, trying to bargain the problem away. Very ineffectual stage, but you might, you might go through a period where you're trying to bargain the problem away. Blame. Blame is uh, you baby. It's not my side of the family. It's that weird Uncle Frank on your side, your side of the family. It's, uh, it's those damn teachers. Blame is where the parent takes all the responsibility and gives it away. None of it's my fault. It's everybody's fault except mine. I, I, how many ed, special ed professionals do we have in the room? Okay, Raise your hand, please, if you've been blamed by a special needs parent for everything that's ever happened, including the attack on Pearl Harbor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, the, what I, my, my advice to, to colleagues at that time is take it seriously, but don't take it personally. They don't mean it personally. Take it seriously, but don't take it personally. And the, the, the blame stage is when you take all the responsibility and give it away. And the reason I point that out is you're going to see a stage coming up later that's the mirror image, the opposite of that stage. Mourning. Mourning is one of the most misunderstood words in English language. If I were to go to downtown Harwood and ask the first, like, found downtown Harwood, um, and, and, <laughs> and went up to the first, I'm sorry, sorry, you know, and went up to the first 50 people I've said, tell me what mourning means, they would tell me mourning means sadness. Mourning doesn't mean sadness. Mourning doesn't mean sadness. The Boston Red Sox won the World Series in 2004. I just like saying that. It's got nothing to do with that. <laughs> well, the Red Sox won the series in 2004, and I tell a story about the Red Sox and people associate with them. I'm a big Red Sox fan. When we won it, we, I got like 300 emails congratulating me like I had something to do with it. But people used to say to me, you haven't won it in 86 years. What will happen? What will happen when Boston finally wins it? I used to say, oh, God, they'll close the city down. It, they didn't. You know what happened in Boston? We went into mourning. We went into mourning, because being a Sox fan is generational. You were a Sox fan, your dad's a Sox fan, his dad was a Sox fan. And the moment we won the series, I was with family and friends watching the game on TV, the moment we won the series, I did not see this coming like a thunderbolt. My first thought when that last out was made was my grandfather. Sitting on our front porch with this little red transistor radio, listening to every bloody inning of every bloody game, trying to pronounce Yastrzemski, you know, and, and, and during the 60s when they couldn't buy a win, and my first thought was, oh, wouldn't you love to see this? It's not really sadness, it's just reflecting on what it might have been. You have a beautiful autumn morning like this in New England, you just lost an uncle uh, who used to love to hunt and fish. You look outside and say, ah, oh, wouldn't you love a day like today? That's morning, it's not sadness. By the way, a good friend of mine, the day after we won the series, got up from his desk spontaneously, went, bought a bottle of champagne, went and bought a Red Sox cap, went to his dad's grave, put the cap on the hat, opened the champagne, and toasted his dad. We finally did it. We looked around the cemetery, there were five other guys doing the same. <laughs> but see, that's mourning, and you might go through a period of mourning. It's not really sadness, it's just, oh, he's such a big, good-looking kid. If it wasn't for the disability, if it wasn't for the disability, if only, if only. And you go through a period of mourning. Period of fear. Maybe it's worse than it does. Will she? Uh, will she ever marry? Will Will he ever work? Will she ever be independent? I do a workshop four times a year in Boston as a public service to a very, very special group of people. Special needs dads only. No moms. No uh, 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 No professionals. You can't get in unless you're the dad, dad of a special needs kid. The meeting is supposed to run seven to nine. I've never been home before one o'clock in the morning. I bring a psychologist with me now because this stuff comes out of that meeting I'm not ready to handle because this is very tough on the dad. And we're going to talk about why it's so tough on the dad, but if this is really, really tough on the dad. And one of the questions that always comes up is, will she ever be independent? Because you see, this is the way life is supposed to go. We're blessed with, Jen and I are blessed with three wonderful kids. They didn't happen to have any learning struggles. We're really blessed with three wonderful kids. And I love them. And they're all out of the house now. It's empty nest. 
I wasn't looking forward to that. I adore our kids. I wasn't looking forward to them leaving, but I know that's the way life is supposed to go. You see, here's the way life is supposed to go. You meet somebody, you fall in love, and you get married. But you don't know each other really well, and you don't have any money. So you spend a couple of years getting to know each other. Then you start cycling the kids through. And it takes about 25 years to get the kids through. And now you're alone again the way you were 25 years before, except now you've got a little bit of money, you know each other better, you know, you can do all the things you couldn't do when you were alone 25 years before. And at one point, the dad looks at the kid, if the kid's got a moderate to severe disability, he looks at the kid at 17 and says, you're never going anywhere, are you? We're never going to be alone, are we? It's always going to be me and her and you. And that causes real conflict for the dad because he loves the kid, but it's complicating the plan. It's complicating the plan. And one thing that many parents, when you're in the fear stage, one of the things that parents have that regular parents, traditional parents cannot even begin to relate with, and that is this. What would ever happen to him if something happened to us? I poll audiences when I speak. I ask, say, raise your hand if you're a parent of typical kids. And I say, how many times did you think about this when you were a kid, when your kids were growing up? And they say, none. It wasn't on my radar screen. Many parents in the fear stage with a severely special needs kid, it's the first thing they think about in the morning, the last thing they think about before they fall asleep. What would ever happen to him if something happened to us? If something happened to us, Sally could go to the live with Aunt Jane, that'd be great. Billy could live with Uncle Frank, that'd be terrific. Well, what about Tony? Nobody understands Tony. Nobody gets Tony. He'll end up a ward of the state. Oh my God. So yeah, we will go to Disney World, but you take the six o'clock flight. I'll take the seven o'clock flight, I'll leave you to the airport. I can't tell you the number of parents I know, especially these kids, will not fly in the same way, will not ride in the same train. Because I've got much in fear of what would ever happen to him if something happened to us together. So you might go through a period of fear, anger. Those teachers or doctors, they don't know anything. I hate the school, I hate this neighborhood, I hate this kid. I had a parent say to me in a counseling session, you know, Rick, sometimes, I've never said this before, but sometimes I look at it and I, this feels almost like hate. I say, whoa, that's all good, that's okay. It's part of the process. If a stranger came into your home and disrupted your family the way this kid has, it ain't him. It's, it, the momentary flashes, don't be, it, that's the way you handle it, the matters, of course, it's the way you handle it, but something, sometimes you just get mad. I bet a parent say, I'm mad, I don't even know what I'm mad at. I'm just mad. That's because you're in the anger stage. You're in the anger stage, and you might go through a period of anger. Guilt, I call this the mom stage, because mom is so good at this. Guilt is mea culpa, mea culpa. Remember I said that's what the opposite of the blame stage? Blame stage is it's everybody's fault but mine. Guilt stage is mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa, it's all my fault. I kept him too long in the playpen. I shouldn't have gone back to work. My mother said to use cloth diapers, I use pampers, and now my kid's got a learning disability. <laughs> I had a mother say to me one time, she said, Rick, I've never told anybody this, but I know the reason God gave me a special needs kid is to punish me for something bad I did in high school. I said, lady, if God gave special needs kids, everybody would have had a nice Everybody would have one, and I'd have sex, okay? So what? <laughs> but the period of guilt, mea culpa, mea culpa, you know, what have I done to cause this? I'm a bad mom. Envy. Envy is a very interesting thing. Envy is where you say, look at my sister's kids. She couldn't pick her kid's teachers out of a police lineup. She didn't even know what grade her kids are in. She's got this special job, and she goes to work before the kids get up. At the time she gets home work, the kids are in bed. There was babysitters and child care all the time. Here, I'm mother of the year, looking up stuff on the internet, going to school all the time, going to meetings. Her kids are on a roll. My kid can't get out of his own way. It's not fair. And you find yourself envying other people's kids. Ooh, what does that do? Or you're back in the guilt, you're not supposed to envy other people's kids. You're supposed to play the hand you're dealt. See how dynamic it is? Are you bouncing around from stage to stage? Isolation, very dangerous stage for the family, very dangerous stage. Isolation is when you circle the wagons around the kid and say, nobody understands this kid except us. No one understands, nobody cares except us. You, you destroy the support system you've been building for years. You stop taking the therapy, you take them off the medication, you cancel all the appointments. I say to my colleagues, therapists, you're going to get a call from families and they say, you know what, we're not coming anymore, it's not doing any good. Keep the appointment open, they'll be back in a couple of weeks. They just did it. When you develop this idea that nobody cares except us, and you circle the rags around the kids and us against the world. And the reason that's a dangerous stage is not only don't you let you don't let anyone in and you destroy the support system you build, but you also don't let anyone out. 
So the 17-year-old sister says, I've got a date on Saturday night. Rhonda says, you can't go out on Saturday night. You know your little brother doesn't have any friends. And he wants us to stay in on Saturday night and watch Raider the Lost Ark for the 15th time and have popcorn. And if you really loved your brother, and you were really a good sister, you'd stay in on Saturday night. Now that water bed's rocking and rolling, folks. Rocking and rolling. Now the 17-year-old daughter can't have a date on Saturday night because of the 14-year-old special needs brother. So isolation, a very, very dangerous stage. Depression. Not a, not a, a clinical depression, but a situational depression. I'll call a parent and say, Rick, there's no sense in coming in. No, nothing's going to work. Nothing's gonna, we're going to be done right on time, by the way. You guys got counseling. We'll be done right on time. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you might go through period of depression. Flight. Very, very dangerous stage. Let's try this therapy. We'll be mentioning it on the view. We've got the own website. I'm going to go from clinic to clinic, doctor to doctor, trying to find a solution to the problem. When you're in the flight stage, you're looking for simple answers. You go to the school, the school, your public school, public school says, well, you've got to come to six meetings a year, the kid's got to go to school in a special bus, and he can't go to school with his brothers and sisters. You don't like that deal. So you come to an independent school. Independent school says, well, it's going to cost you a lot of money. All of a sudden, you turn on the TV at 2 o'clock in the morning, and there's some wacko selling something that's going to make it go away, and you're in the flight stage, you buy into that. Millions of dollars made on those magic lenses that were going to make dyslexic kids see. We're going to make dyslexic kids read. Giving a dyslexic kid special glasses is like giving a deaf kid a hat. It's not going to help. It's got nothing to do with the problem. And yet millions of dollars made parents in the flight stage who are desperate for a simple answer. There is no simple answer to this. When you're in the flight stage, you bounce around and bounce around and bounce around. After you've been through all that stuff, if you're lucky, you end up at acceptance. By virtue of the fact you are here today, you're probably accepted. You're not going to send your kid off to a school in the beautiful woods of Massachusetts unless you accept that there's a problem. So you're in acceptance. You've accepted there's a problem. Let's go. But why do I like that model so much? Why do I like that model so much? Well, first of all, it explains why Tony and I disagreed so strongly over, this, over the same uh, parents over a period of time. And I'll tell you why. I don't often share this, but let me share with you why I feel so strongly about this model. Um, what does this model look like? Anybody seen the stage model like this? Yeah, it's the stages of grief. Kubler Ross's work on grief, on death and dying. Now, Kubler Ross was doing her work in Europe at the same time Westhead was doing her work. They didn't communicate, but they came up with basically the same stages. It's very different than Kubler Ross. Kubler Ross is very, lit very uh, linear. You know, it's predictable. This is totally unpredictable. But you know, frankly, my wife and I went to graduate school together. We took a course on Kubler, Kubler Ross. We understood Kubler Ross, and shortly after that, we had a very tragic death in our family. And I don't think we could have handled it. I don't think we'd still be married 43 years. I don't think we'd still be together if we didn't understand it. Because I'd be depressed. And I'd come home from work, I'm depressed. I need Janet to put me together. I know Janet, you know, you know, Janet's got to put me together. I'm feeling depressed. And I'd walk in the house and she's throwing the dishes in the dishwasher, kicking the dog for no reason. And I think, okay, you're angry. <laughs> you're angry. I got that. You're angry. I was angry last week. And when I was angry last week, the last thing I needed was some depressed guy hanging around. So I'm going to give you the space. I'm not going to take it personally. I'll give you, and I'll call my brother and I'll be depressed with him. But right now, you're, I mean, it really got it through because we understood. We understood. So the first thing that it first thing it explained is um, how Tony and I disagreed about the same set of parents. But more importantly, folks, just because you met somebody, fell in love, and got married and had kids, does not mean you're going to walk hand in hand through this model. And what happens is, mom is at one stage, and dad is at another. And for the first time in your marriage, you can't communicate. For the first time in your marriage, you're facing a crisis and a problem, and you cannot communicate about it. So here's what happens. Mom's in the flight stage. She's looking for a simple answer. Dad's in the isolation stage. Circle the wagons. Nobody understands this kid except us. Dad comes home from work. Mom's sitting in the driveway on the suitcase with the kid. Don't turn off the car. We're going to New Jersey. <laughs> there was a guy in Oprah, and there was, who said if you put cod liver oil in a kid's stomach and put him under a sun lamp, the learning disability goes away. We're going to New Jersey. Mom's in the flight stage. Dad's in the isolation stage. Hold it, babe. Hold it. Nobody understands this kid except you and me. And I'm not all that sure about you. <laughs> <laughs> but no wacko from New Jersey's going to get his hands on my kid. We're not going. You just don't want to spend the money. It's got nothing to do with the money. Well, it was Billy you'd spend on. Don't you tell me I love one of my kids would, and boom, they're off to the races, and they don't even know why. I keep this laminated under my desk. 
And when I deal with parents, I take it out and I say, where are we? Where are we today? The reality is, the reason, the divorce rate among the American, American public now is 50%. Recent survey for kids with moderate to severe disabilities, divorce separation rate is 71%. And it's because of this. It's because you're looking at, for the first time in your life, you're looking at the same problem with very different lenses. And very quickly in the time you've got left, some of the new stuff we've learned about this, I'm afraid it's all bad news. Mom's going through the stages, dad's going through the stages, and who else is going through the stages? The kid is going through the stages. So mom's feeling guilty, dad's feeling depressed, and the kid's feeling uh, 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 isolated, and you sit down to talk about the report card. I will sell tickets to that event, okay? <laughs> that is not exactly a petri dish for successful communication. The other thing we've learned is who stays in denial longer, mom or dad? 95% of the cases, dad. Dad stays in denial longer. I'm dealing with a family. They. They got the diagnosis, they were in denial, mom came out of denial, went through all this stuff all by herself, now she's out of acceptance. Dad was in denial the whole time. Remember the wife said to me in a counseling session one time, for the first time I know what it must be like to be a, uh, to be a single parent. Because this kid, yeah, my husband is not there for me on this. I had a bottle of breast cancer, he never left my side. My mom and dad died in the same month, he was my rock. But he's not here for me on this. Now she's in acceptance. He's dropped down in the ball and he's bouncing around. And he goes to her and he says, honey, I'm really feeling depressed. She said, talk to the hand. You weren't there for me. You weren't there for me. I'm not going to be there for you. And I said to her, but you've been there before. You can help. No, he wasn't there for me. But he, I know he wasn't there for you. Get the pound of flesh. You'll be divorced in a year five. And the little boy, seven years old, in the counseling session said to me, I think my mom and dad got getting a divorce, and I think it's because of me. And there's 700,000 words in English language, and I know a lot of them, but I couldn't think of the words to say, yeah, it is. It is. It's not your fault, but it's because of you. They were an intact super couple until this happened. And now they probably are going to get a divorce. And yes, it is because of you. Because they just don't get it. They don't understand. So dad stays in denial longer for two reasons. One is, not in all cases, but in many cases, the apple did not fall far from the tree. And dad had trouble in school himself. And not because he doesn't love his kid, but because he does. Mom says, I think Johnny's having trouble in school. Dad says, I don't want to hear about it. I don't, don't tell me. I don't hear it, it's going to be fine. Basically what dad is saying is don't make me go there, baby. Don't make me sit at work every day knowing he's going through what I went through. Please. And the other reason dad denies it is mom is so good at being mom. Here's what happens in a traditional family, whatever that is anymore. The kid comes home from school at the end of the day, I hate that school, I hate that school, throws his books in the fireplace, kicks the dog, slaps the sister, sits at the table, I hate that school, I hate that school. Mom sits down, strokes his hair, gets him all calmed down. Make some, some cocoa, put some marshmallow in, helps him with his homework. 6.30, the kid's watching, uh, they're watching, uh, uh, watching ESPN. Dad comes home from work. Hi, honey, what's up? I'm worried about Johnny. He's having trouble in school. Hey, Johnny, how, how you doing? I'm fine, Dad. He's fine. He's fine. See, Dad doesn't see it. I've had five times in my career where Dad sit in my office and say, the reason I'm here today is I was home from work sick yesterday, and I saw him get off the school bus. I've never seen that before. I've never seen that before. And the last thing, and this is the bad news in this, the last thing is this, acceptance is not permanent. You used to think once you'd accept it, you've got the holy grail. You were there. You were there. It's, but we realize now, anytime there's a major change in a kid's life, you get thrown right back up in the model again. So you folks are all sitting there, you've accepted the problem, you've got a wonderful school that's dealing effectively, effectively with your kids, you could be happy. Well, it's going to come a time, they're going to call, and they say it's going to be time to move on and you're gonna get thrown right back up in there again. And then you're gonna get to college, you're gonna settle down, things are good, and it's time to leave there, and you get, it's, it's a cycle. We thought once you got to acceptance, you were all good, but it's a cycle that goes on and on and on. I got a couple more things I wanted to do, but I really wanna to stick to the schedule, so let me close with this. First of all, it is amazingly, amazingly wonderful to be home. Um, and I will always consider this place home, and PJ always made me feel that way. It's just wonderful to be home and to be with you. And I guess a message to the moms and the dads, a message to the moms, what my business, what my, it says on my business card is kids need love most when they deserve it least. When they are at their absolute worst is when mom needs to be at her absolute best. And being a father of three, I think the best advice I can give to the dad is to always remember this. She's their mommy, not yours. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs>